our speaker this morning is uh, Professor Matt Wilson. Uh, he is at MIT in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences, and today he will be speaking about hippocampal memory, cognition, and the role of sleep. I have two sessions today, which I you know, see, which is great because um, you know in the past I've given uh, a lecture on the topic of hippocampal function, uh, which covers principles of electrophysiology of the hippocampal system, and then touches on issues of coding, and then tries to relate it to computational mechanisms of of uh, hippocampal contributions to memory and the role of sleep. And so I'm gonna split this in two. I guess I have two opportunities to cover this. In the first part, we'll be uh, talking about some of the basic electrophysiology of hippocampus, introducing some topics that I think are particularly relevant, both for our understanding of the hippocampal function, of brain function, and hopefully will spur thinking about uh, perhaps novel ways of incorporating one feature, which I always feel has been um, uh, under leveraged in the areas of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, largely due to sort of uh, kind of historical and also contemporary thinking about network function, distributed network function, role of connectivity, and that's the role of temporal dynamics. And, you know, one thing about brain systems is that's always been <clears throat> it's always been sort of leveraged as as uh, as a weakness, and that is that when you look at the time constants associated with brain computation, they tend to be relatively slow. I mean, you know, you're thinking about, you know, kind of, you know, discrete digital computation operating in megahertz, gigahertz, and, you know, you're talking about brain systems operating at the time scale of hertz. I mean, <laughs> you think this is sort of like a, you know, a tortoise and the hare issue. And yet, um, as um, uh, when I was a graduate student at Caltech, uh, back in, in another age. And I was working with Carver Mead, who was part of this the, the sort of nascent program in um, of biology and computation. And that was the, the, the CNS program at Caltech. Uh, it's one of the first, I was in, the, in that first class. And Carver had gotten interested in uh, the, the notion of analog computing as a way of uh, kind of both bridging the gap between the study of brain function biology computation, but also, you know, bringing back a perspective on computing, which leveraged this very basic property of analog systems. And then that is that there are some things that they are exceptionally, almost uniquely good at. And, you know, the best for me, the one thing that I always remember, the best example he always gave was, you know, you kind of think about a transistor, for instance. One thing that it does, it, it will, you know, it will outcompute any digital system, and that is computing something very simple. That's a derivative. The, the nature of the analog computation gives you instantaneous computation of derivatives. There's no estimation. There's no iterative calculation. You know, you don't need to, you know, do your Taylor expansions. It just gives you an instantaneous readout of the derivative. And so thinking about that, you know, the derivative, man, analog systems give you derivatives for free, right? And if you have systems that are fundamentally concerned with computing change, it could be, you know, time rate of change or any, any notion of change, and thinking about computation, not necessarily of state, but of state change, wow, that could be very powerful. As we'll see, you know, in, in the hippocampus, while you know you, you're probably familiar with hippocampal function memory and episodic memory, um, I think you know one of the things that we'll see is that the nature of the hippocampal representation is not just of space. I often kind of joke about uh, the you know when uh, <clears throat> you know John O'Keefe and the Mosers uh, you know got the Nobel Prize for their discoveries of uh, spatial coding in the hippocampus. Uh, which, you know, very well deserved, you know, uh, kind of a seminal discovery. But the tagline, that, you know, uh, <clears throat> that was given to that discovery was, you know, the discovery of the brain's GPS. And to me, that was just <laughs> it, it. It so misrepresented the fundamental nature of the finding, which was the link between in the hippocampus a system involved in spatial navigation, and then fundamental aspects of memory, in particular episodic memory. What is it that links these two things? So the idea that it's about computing a state, a state being a location, is that really what it's about, just computing location? Or is it using location to compute things about 
like planning. Where am I going to go? Where have I been? How can I take, you know, my experience with trajectories or a history of state change and construct models that are capable of doing what the transistor does, which is sort of computing derivatives instantaneously. What is going to happen next? What is the, you know, what is a simple analog model that can predict changes in the world? So that's the, that's sort of the basic essence. How does the hippocampus do that? How does the hippocampus, and this just shows, you know, a rat brain, overlying neocortex uh, removed to reveal the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is one of these kind of evolutionary, evolutionarily conserved structures. Here in cross section, <coughs> Uh, showing the classic, what's referred to as trisynaptic loop, input coming from, you know, across the, you know, the brain, converging on associated multimodal associational areas, entering into the adjacent entronal cortex, where in the Mosers discovered uh, cells that that show this uh, kind of Cartesian-like regularity, the grid cells, uh, but. When you kind of step back, you see the entorhinal cortex really reflects this broad kind of polymodal integrations where you find a uh, convergence of uh, a kind of parietal spatial information, but also temporal, uh, you know, temporal lobe information about object identity. You have sensory information from the olfactory cortex, you know, auditory, visual. So you have this sort of broad integration of world state information in the entorhinal cortex, and that comes in. Uh, in this pathway, the perforant path, making these synapses first on uh, granule cells in the dentate gyrus, dentate gyrus is CA3, CA3, a strong recurrent connectivity, leading to uh, notions that this is serving as a, uh, a highly recurrent autoassociative memory, from CA3 to CA1, CA1 to subiculum, subiculum out, CA1 also projects back to the entorhinal cortex and out. So you have this loop, all this, all this sort of you know, high dimensional, high order world state information, entorhinal cortex, runs through this little loop back to the entorhinal cortex and then out. And there's an interesting organization of the entorhinal cortex, that entorhinal cortex, the, the, uh, the hippocampus is an example of an older kind of cortex uh, that has this archicortical structure, three layered structure, very simple. You have a, you know, a single layer, look largely single layer, there might be like sub layers, but Single layer of cells, you have input comes in, it's processed there, and, and comes out. Unlike neocortical structures that have this isocortex or six-layered-like structure, this adjacent entorhinal cortex is more like the six-layered, that is, it's got superficial and deep layers, and the superficial layers serve as the input to the hippocampus, and then the deep layers serve as the output. So the, you know, the hippocampus, you can kind of think of the hippocampus it's sort of like this one-way archicortex. It's like it's like this feed-forward. It's like this feed-forward path, feed-forward system. Stuff comes in, and then it largely goes out. Where now you have neocortex that is that is evolved to have these multiple layers, superficial and deep, where the entorhinal cortex both sends input in, but also receives it back out, and then can communicate between those two. So thinking about this, what would be the function of a circuit like this? evolutionarily conserved, but simpler than the, you know, we think of as, the, you know, the neocortical, uh, you know, networks that now start to leverage multiple layers, which we see now ubiquitously in, you know, deep learning systems where, you know, more layers means, you know, more powerful computation. So here you've got this rinky-dink, you know, archicortex. <laughs> what is this? It's got like one layer. <laughs> what can it do? Um, and... Uh, kind of thinking about that, what's what, what's the essential computation that would be performed by this circuit? Why would you keep this circuit around when you've got all these other circuits, you know, evolving with greater heterogeneity and complexity, adding multiple layers, and yet the hippocampus remains relatively unchanged. If you were to look at the circuitry here in a rodent hippocampus and compare it to human hippocampus, other than changes in size and volume, largely largely unchanged, with some interesting differences. One being, if you notice in the nomenclature, you've got dentate gyrus, you've got CA3, and then CA1. And you might think, well, what the hell happened to CA2? Is that not a two? <laughs> There's also a four, the CA3 and CA4, which is sort of in here, the dentate, uh, in the margin between CA3 and dentate. But CA2 is kind of a sort of glaring <laughs> absence. What, ha what happened to it? Well, it just turns out that in rodents, 
CA2 is, uh, is kind of a more marginal structure is present. And it can be distinguished based on the, connect, the patterns of connectivity and other electrophysiological properties. So it is distinct. Uh, but when you look in humans, the thing that has actually changed evolutionarily is vast expansion of CA2. So CA2 is kind of a lot bigger relative to these other structures. So that kind of gives you some clues. Well, maybe CA2 is actually something that you know, reflects the differences in function and in capacity of hippocampal computation in these two systems. What is it that humans do that rodents don't necessarily do? And I mean, I'll leave it to you to think, well, what might those things be? Uh, and when we look at, at uh, navigation, you think, ah, humans, rodents, are they really that different? And when you think about other kinds of functions, for instance, in social cognition and, uh, 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 you know, kind of lifelong episodic memory function. These are clearly things that are different. Rodent, you know, on the, you know, if it has a good run, maybe has a lifespan of three or four years. Human, right? It's, it's order, an order of magnitude at least greater than that. So you might think, well, maybe CA2 is some function in, you know, episodic memory processing or complexity of social interaction. Um, and that that can be distinguished from its role in navigation, which might be very similar. And so now I think that introduces the idea that there must be some shared computation between these systems, but also something that can be distinguished in terms of function and capacity between uh, systems like rodent and human. And what might that difference, what the similarity and difference be? So I just, I just I, you know, I always put this out as kind of a simple working hypothesis. And that is that the role of the hippocampus is demonstrated through, uh, you know, lesion studies and the classic case of, of uh, you know, Henry Meliasin, HM, who I'm sure you're all familiar with, who underwent the surgical procedure involving, involving bilateral resection of the medial temporal lobe, lost the ability to form new memories of experience, or so-called episodic memory. And so that's what really launched interest in the hippocampus, like a singular structure that seems to have it's sort of this, like this, the... You know, the, the, the idea of, you know, modular function in the brain, like certain brain areas carrying out very specific functions was, was, uh, had you know, fallen into some disfavor at that time. There was a, a view of kind of larger distributed holistic, uh, you know, computation, computation uh, advocated by, you know, at, at, uh, early in the, you know, in the 1950s by uh, people like Carl Lashley, who argued that, well, you know, more... That, you know, brain is just is largely homogeneous. The more brain is better. If you take out, you know, brain, you just sort of gradually lose function. But there isn't any, like, specific function that you lose by taking out a specific brain area. And this uh, clearly demonstrated that was not the case. That there was a very specific function that was lost. And that was the ability to form experiential memory, the ability to perform, uh, you know, procedural like skill learning uh, was largely unaffected. Uh, so there was a whole, you know, there's sort of a whole uh, um, line of research into the cognitive functions of uh, both the hippocampus and, and the cognitive organization of brain systems that emerged from that. But again, taking this basic working hypothesis, and so the idea that navigation is a shared function, damage the hippocampus in humans and rodents impairs ability to do simple spatial navigation going to the bathroom and remembering, uh, you know, where it is based on experience. I actually just, I had that experience just when, when I came in today. I mean, I know where the bathroom here is, uh, but I also know, so, you know, I could have actually walked out to that door, walked around, gone stairs, but I happen to know that this, go out, this exit is just a wee bit shorter. It's just, even though you have to go outside and come back in, it's just a wee bit shorter. So I actually went out here. I went out here, came back in. Uh, and so that requires it, my experience, the kind of route-based experience of going from here, going up here, down the stairs, down the hall corridors, going to the bathroom. And then with experience, you can come to realize, well, actually, there's a slightly shorter path. And that is this sort of the translation from a largely topological-like representation to a topographic represent topographic carrying spatial metric information, angle and distance. And so that allows you to do things like computing shortcuts. 
And that kind of computation and function seems to be preserved across, let's say, rodent humans. But there's also this linked episodic memory, again, in the case of uh, you know, HM. So what connects these two things? And so this working hypothesis is that both of them are, you know, sort of depend critically, both these functions depend critically on, uh, of, on sort of capturing and evaluating temporal sequence information. That is the order of state, order of experience states. And then from that, taking the, uh, the, the what, as I describe it, these sort of three steps in building higher order models. First, you have to, first you have to capture the data. What have you actually seen? What are the states and what are their time orderings? Uh, so that you can then use that to infer causality, which is the next step. Why? You know, if we went from A to B, you know, <laughs> were they related in some way? I push the button, the door opens. Whoa, you know, maybe there's some, maybe there's a correlation there. And then from there, the, the third step, as I like to describe it, is the how. And that is you go from what, what happened, why did it happen for causality, and then how, which is sort of invert that causality to uh, allow you to uh, uh, leverage these temporal relationships in a goal-directed fashion. If I now want to open the door, what do I do? So I have to kind of invert that. I want to open the door, what do I do? Press the button because I've experienced button to door. With enough experience, I've been able to determine that buttons actually open doors. So uh, the first step is capturing temporal sequential order structure. Second step, inferring causality. Third step, inverting that uh, into uh, uh, causal goal-directed models. So let's just look at you know, the hippocampus with this eye toward understanding temporal sequence processing. And you know, in the contemporary, this sort of contemporary neuroscience, there are many uh, tools available for studying brain function, some of them more suited to uh, looking at certain aspects of computation than others. Uh, the one that I had started using when I was uh, actually a graduate student and a postdoc was the sort of old school electrophysiology. This is, the, this is putting wires into the brain, very fine wires that have conductors that, are, uh, that have insulated shafts with very small tips, allowing those tips to record the electric fields generated by neurons that are nearby. Uh, and with proper signal processing and positioning, you can isolate certain signals, in this case, the spike discharges uh, that are generated by nearby cells. Uh, a slight uh, enhancement of that uh, approach is shown here, which is Instead of putting in single wires, you put in small bundles of wires, in this case, four wires uh, in what's referred to as a tetrode configuration. The tetrode configuration just gives you, you kind of, you sort of think about uh, the basic physics of um, the detection or measurement of electric fields. Field strength is going to be a function of distance. And so if you kind of think, you know, sort of think about <coughs> uh, um, that, you know, that, that, that voltage, I have a wire, I think about it as a string, the string measures the distance. If I take that string and I tie it to, you know, let's say to this neuron, I get a reading of that neuron, but I can now move that string around and it will trace out a surface, spherical surface, and any cell on that surface is going to generate a potential that is exactly the same exactly the same amplitude. So a single wire will let you record lots of cells. It's just that you won't be able to tell the difference between this cell and that cell because if they discharge, they're exactly the same distance away. Can't tell the difference. If I add in a second wire, and that's like two strings, I got a string going from this one and from this one. So you think about that. So, okay, now I can't move that as long as I keep those you know, strings taut. I can't trace out a sphere anymore, but I do trace out a circle. And so I've gone from three dimensions to two dimensions, right? It, Big, great gain. I can tell the difference between, let's say, this cell and this cell, as long as they don't lie along this circle. If I add a third contact, now I go from, you know, sort of three string or two strings to three strings. Three strings now constrains you. I can't, I can't trace out any surfaces, but I have a single point and its reflection. So I've gone from a surface, right, to uh, a uh, you know, to a circle, to two points, and then adding in the fourth 
gives me the final constraint. So the unique identification of points in three-dimensional space can be achieved by optimal four, you know, sort of four-point sampling, four non-coplanar points. So that's the idea. How can you put in a bunch of wires and uh, uniquely identify the amplitude signature of cells that are distributed in space based on their um, the, the amplitudes of the fields generated by action potentials. Uh, and if you put in a bunch of these, this is just a microdrive device that allows you to you know, run the wires down into the brain, position the tips close to, close to in, this, in these cell layers so that there are large populations of cells, and then leave it there chronically. So this is a device that would get in, implanted on an animal's head. You, uh, you drill a little hole in the, in the, in the skull. People have been doing humans have been doing for millennia for whatever reason here this is about you know maybe a, a millimeter or two opening this gets cemented on the animal's head you then over while the animal's awake and running around you can advance these electrodes put them in position then just leave them there uh, indefinitely to get long-term chronic recording this is what the data looks like it's just a cartoon uh, showing with you know approximately the scale uh, these are um, you know, neurons in the order of 10 to 20 micron, uh, you know, diameter distributed around contacts that are on the order of about 8 to 15 uh, microns. And if you record, for instance, the uh, uh, action potential discharge from, the, a sing from one cell, it's going to be picked up by these four wires. Amplitude is going to be inversely correlated with the, uh, with the, with the distance. So... If it's closer to this wire than this wire, the amplitude is going to be larger on this channel than this channel. And so this gives you, for a population of cells around this wire, it's going to give you this, uh, this kind of cluster distribution of points where action potentials here are large in channel one, small on channel two. That means it's close to channel one, far from channel two. Uh, and so using this, you can pick up from single site collection of individual action potentials from multiple cells. You say, now why? Okay, why, why are you doing all this, right? Put in wires, you just, you know, you got these diagrams. Why don't you just like put in, you, know, you put in like a little mini scope, your calcium imaging. You're talking about, you know, recording dozens of cells. Even if I put in, let's say, a dozen or more electrodes, I'm talking about hundreds of cells. I know you can put in like these mini scopes and record thousands of cells, tens of thousands of cells. There, you know, in some model systems, you can record entire brains in behaving animals, for instance, in zebrafish. So why are you, you know, why would you use a method like this? And so, the, you know, there are always trade-offs. And the trade-off here is you get absolute precision in the timing of discrete identifiable events, action potentials. And to the extent that action potential events, single events, and their timing matters, what you might think of as a temporal code, and that is that if, if, if brain cells are using the, uh, the occurrence and timing of individual spikes as a means of transmitting information, then you need to know when those spikes occurred. On the other hand, maybe you just want to know the amount of activity, how many spikes are generated, you know, how active is the cells, what, what you might think of as a rate code, as the number of spikes per unit time. Uh, and that kind of code would evolve on a, on a longer time scale, and you would perhaps be, you know, uh, be able to measure that kind of change, slower rate of change in activity using another signal. For instance, calcium. Calcium, which responds to, you know, sort of metabolic electrical activity in cells. So if you look at calcium signals, they tend to change slowly. They tend to, you know, reflect average activity, and you can measure them over large populations. Great tool for looking at large-scale distributed rate coding. But you don't get precise single spike time. Even using approaches to try to like deconvolve, the, you know, the signal to compensate for the time constant differential, is still not the same signal. Calcium signal is not the electrical signal generated by action potential. So that's sort of the trade-off: fewer cells, greater temporal precision. Temporal coding is important. This is the way to look at it. If distributed rate coding is the, you know, is important then other methods are appropriate. Now, what I'm going to show and argue is that both actually, both strategies are employed. Both are employed, but they are, they are uh, uh, they're leveraged through another form of temporal coding, 
which is uh, in phase lock, preferred phase locking to intrinsic rhythms. So, you know, much like, you know, you have, uh, like on your radio, you have, you know, in, uh, you pick up FM stations, you know, if you take well, any station, like AM or FM, they use different temporal coding strategies, but if you look at these different stations, each station is using a precise kind of temporal coding to communicate the content. But then there's also another, you know, form of coding, which allows you to switch channels. So you can switch channels of communication using either, it could be like a frequency or phase code. And then within that, you can use the precise timing uh, to communicate the information. The hippocampus uses a similar strategy, phase coding to select channels, and then timing within those phase windows to communicate information, temporal coding. And so that now brings up the third level, which I haven't pointed out here, uh, which is available largely through the electrophysiology, which is the, the local field potential. Sometimes you refer to it as the EEG, which is the sort of the macroscopic aggregate fields that are generated largely by um, the, uh, the current dipoles that result from synaptic input. So while action potentials are generated, generate fields <coughs> that are restricted, spatially restricted, small dipoles, you have to be close to them to see them. Synaptic inputs, because of the distributed, the spatially distributed nature of dendrites, tend to generate current dipoles, current coming in one point and then going out in another point that are large. Large dipoles, dipoles you can see at a large distance. If you have many of them aligned, then they, you know, through the superposition, you can actually see they, they're large in magnitude. And so you can pick up through, the elect, through looking at local field potentials a complementary measure, which is what is the coordinated input to a set of structures? So it's important to really think about those two things differently. Even though they're both electric fields, the fields generated by synaptic inputs are, reflect the inputs. Fields generated by action potentials are the output. And so looking at LFPs gives you an indication of what's the, you know, what's the input coordination and how is, that, how is that related to the output? So thinking about spike to you know, LFP phase locking is kind of giving you insight into the nature of the transfer function from input to output. Uh, uh, and it's interesting to think about, uh, you know, Mike, I don't know if you're, you know, you'll talk about some of these, you know, some of the methods for you know, interrogating uh, like you know, human brain function, different forms of imaging, which give you, you know, sort of related uh, you know, related kind of information, and you know what does, for instance, you know, you know, uh, kind of metabolic, you know, functional, uh, you know, MRI give you, and it gives you a signal that is going to be related to both of these, since it's just sort of general metabolic activity. Uh, but because it's going to combine both, you're going to think about it as reflecting both synaptic input and spike output, depending on exactly how those things, you know, kind of differentially. Uh, uh, leverage the metabolism of cells. You know, largely you do not. And, you know, that's because the nature of the, the uh, you know, LFPs, you can certainly, so for instance, you put an, elect an electrode here so that it can actually detect cells, you're also going to see the LFP. The LFP, because, you know, you're going to have large, you're going to see large dipoles as well as the small dipoles here. Um, but um, if you think about uh, let's say I move the electrode up to here. I will still see the large dipoles, but I won't see the small dipoles. So I, I can see LFP over, like, you know, broad spatial extents. I won't see spikes until I'm very close unless the activity is synchronized. So if I have many spikes being generated in a short period of time where the dipoles tend to be aligned, then I will actually see that. And that was referred to, you know, that was often used, this so-called population spike, where you see this kind of synchronized activity. But that's a special condition. So like anything along the axon, you know, the dipoles there are very small. And so the principle is pretty straightforward, right? This is just, if I've got, if I, so I think you think of a dipole, it's like charge, opposite charge, current coming in, current going out, right? I've got equal and opposite charges. And if I'm close, I can tell the difference between them. Using a similar principle as triangulation, I can see the difference. Oh, I'm close to this one, closer to this dipole than this one, I see an action potential. If I'm right exactly between both of those dipoles, I see nothing. Uh, and <clears throat> so with a, you know, 
with, a, with an action potential, as I move farther away, the distance, the relative distance to both those dipoles becomes, you know, the same, basically. There are no differences, regardless of where I am, which means I can't see small dipoles. I can't see action potentials at a distance. And that distance you can estimate to be on the order of maybe 50 to 100 microns just based on the expected dipole size. That can change depending on how and where the action potential is generated. Now, that is relevant to certain cell types like hippocampal cells. Hippocampal cells, you, you kind of think of, oh, classic action potentials. Those are generated in the cell body or soma or maybe the axon, axon initial segment, and they're kind of sent out. But they're also active conductances in the dendrites themselves. You can get these so-called dendritic spikes. So it's possible to generate spike events that aren't intended to go out, but are intended to go back or are generated in dendrites and go down. So you can see other types of spikes. And what's interesting there is that the dipoles associated with those spikes can be larger, which means it's easier to see them at a distance. So one of the properties of, of the hippocampus that sort of lends itself to this kind of electrophysiological approach is when you put a lot, you put, you know, these electrodes in here, you see lots of spiking activity. You see, you know, you can get good sampling. You could drop the same electrode into another brain area. Maybe you don't see as many spikes. Why aren't you seeing as many spikes? That means there are fewer cells that are spiking or that the spiking activity isn't, you know, kind of similarly heterogeneous. You're not able to see dendritic spikes because you don't have as much dendritic spiking. So that's kind of a, it's a, you know, it's sort of a cautionary, you know, note that it is possible to be recording spikes in the hippocampus that are actually reflecting dendritic computations, so-called dendritic spikes that are not actually reflecting the output. And there, the way you would be able to potentially, you know, distinguish that is if you actually look at this, you kind of look at the scatter plot, the clustering, so-called clustering, one of the things that you note in hippocampal recordings, this is getting really deep in the weeds on hippocampal electrophysiology, but you know, if you're, if you're into that, and it is relevant, uh, you notice these, these clusters are kind of elongated, right? They change, and now what does that actually mean? Since the, the relative, you know, the amplitude is sort of a function of the dis in inverse distance. So when I draw a circle around it, I say, oh, here's a cluster like this. Well, that means that there are spikes in this so-called cluster or unit Sometimes they have amplitudes like this. Sometimes they have amplitudes like that. Now, what are the two ways of interpreting it? Well, maybe spikes just vary in their amplitude, eh, which they, you know, they do. But by really by that much, this is like this is like a twofold difference in the scale. Um, and then you also notice that they tend to be, you know, they sort of tend to be uh, in kind of aligned here. It's like a line that you can draw, you know, draw through here. So it suggests that. It's at the same relative position. It's just varying in amplitude. But you can also think about this, and that, that's if you had, a, you, know, you had a line like this. But there are also instances where you will see them kind of off axis, right? That means the amplitude is changing, but also the relative distance is changing, right? It's getting larger on one channel than it is on the other. So what you can see from there, you can infer that, well, I have events in which there's fixed location, change in amplitude. And this turns out to be the case in the hippocampus where you see what are referred to as complex spikes generated in the same place, but with different wave shapes and amplitude. And that is a series, a repeated series. If I were to look at this in time, you would see, oh, these spikes aren't just like, you know, they're not just randomly sampled from this. You often see them coming in a, like in a sequence, you know, boom, 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 complex spike. You will also find these clusters that will that will show the sort of nonlinear like uh, cluster distribution, and this suggests that the position is actually shifting, and that would be an example of a propagating. That's the, that is the dipoles are actually shifting. That would be a propagating active dendritic spike. So there's a lot you can draw from just looking at the distribution. You put this in the neocortex, where you have fewer of these active dendritic conductances. What you tend to find is, and you don't see the same kind of complex spiking-like behavior. What you tend to find is the clusters are more compact and more uniform. Uh, yeah, question. To what degree do you see modulation by heartbeat? By heartbeat? Um, I can say personally, I have not actually looked at that. Uh, but there is, 
uh, there's been a lot of interesting stuff looking at modulation by respiration. And with respiration actually tied to a lot of general physiological, you know, uh, measures, including these slower or delta-like oscillations. Uh, you know, it's tied to, um, you know, things like sort of pupillary dilation, general changes in, in these kind of arousal measures, which sort of makes sense. I would expect that heart rate might also correlate with that, with that but things like respiration really do kind of phase lock to it. Uh, and that's kind of interesting, like these lower rhythms tied to, you know, linked to respiration. This is another slight, you know, tangent. Uh, uh, and thinking about the anatomy and structure of the hippocampus relative to other older and newer structures. I pointed to the neocortex, but I didn't point to other older light cortical areas, so-called paleocortex instead of neocortex. And the best example of that is the olfactory cortex, primary piriform cortex. Primary piriform cortex, which structurally and electrophysiologically, electrophysiologically looks remarkably like hip the hippocampus. Similar, you know, it's got a similar archicortical, you know, single layered structure. Uh, it, the, the electrophysiology in individual cells is very similar. And the olfactory cortex kind of exhibits this lower, these kind of lower frequency rhythms that are explicitly tied to resp respiration because that's how olfaction actually works. It's tied to the respiratory cycle. And so you think, oh, you know, both kind of arousal and attention, and that is, you know, how fast I sample, you know, uh, is going to be linked to some sort of active, like active exploration of the environment. And so respiration tied to piriform function, piriform structure and function, now kind of evolving into things like you know, sort of hippocampal function and structure, still retaining this respiratory, you know, lower frequency link. And interesting, the frequency that it was that's that's associated with this the, the kind of respiratory cycle, active sampling respiratory cycle uh, in the piriform cortex, um, uh, and as well as hippocampus and in rodents, the sort of the related active sampling structure, somatosensory cortex, is the theta rhythm, 10 hertz rhythm. You sniff it about 10 hertz, you whisk it about 10 hertz. And as we'll see, this 10 hertz rhythm emerges as kind of a primary rhythm involved in the establishment communication of this temporal coding or phase coding information. So it's all kind of tied together. You know, there's, a, there's like the physical constraint of sampling, like the respiratory constraint and olfactory processing. Now you have these rhythms. It's like, how can I exploit them? Oh, I can use, right, the natural derivative, you know, taking function of this analog system as well as the capacity to distinguish different phases because of the time constant. And, you know, you just kind of, you just leverage it. The system discovers, you, know, you impose a constraint and then you leverage the computation that, uh, that falls from it. So, you know, this is sort of pointing out why do you do the electrophysiology? You get timing information. You get a lot of information about the, the more detailed properties, biophysical properties of cells, by just looking at the uh, electrophile properties of these, um, of these kind of spike amplitude uh, cluster distributions. Just, you know, slight aside, you can actually see, for instance, like complex spike amplitude change. It's actually tied to experience. It's linked to manipulation of molecules involved in plasticity. So you can actually see that these, that these profiles will actually change. They will change with experience as the biophysics of the cells change with experience. You can kind of interrogate plasticity, for instance, on you know, input pathways by looking at changes in the local field potential, but also how they're expressed in uh, action potential wave shape changes. So you go in, you, you identify these clusters, which now, you know, I refer to these as units, units because you, you don't really necessarily know that this is a cell, probably could be tied to a cell, but it could also reflect other compartments of the cell. So it's a unit, could be dendritic, could be, you know, a dendritic compartment, be a cellular, you know, somatic compartment. But anyway, we identify these units and then, you know, this is like data taken over about 10 minutes. And then you can kind of do this, you know, what O'Keefe discovered, uh, when he uh, did the one thing which you know, I feel is really kind of essential for all science, and that is uh, that you have, to, you have to allow the system itself to reveal its function through careful observation. Right? There's a long history of this you know, kind of sort of naturalistic uh, 
uh, um, uh, uh, study of brain function. And in this case, you know, what O'Keefe did, which really revolutionized the thinking of the hippocampus, led to his, you know, kind of seminal work with uh, Lynn Nadell, uh, O'Keefe and Nadell, and as, you know, the hippocampus is a cognitive map trying to link the phenomenology associated with hippocampal lesion with some of the recent insights that had come from O'Keefe's measurement of electrophysiological properties of the, uh, of the hippocampus. And there, the big, you know, the big insight was to say, well, you know, rodents have a hippocampus. They don't just use them to, you know, do classical conditioning, which is what most of the work had been done, thinking about, you know, you had head fixed animals, you're, you know, you're doing kind of, you know, classic classical conditioning. Um, you just let the animals out, took the animals out of the head book. Just let's, let's allow rats to do what rats normally do, allow them to navigate in space, put them on the tabletop, let them move around. And that's where he really discovered, that's where he discovered the spatial correlate and then went on to, you know, kind of elaborate on that, link spatial correlates to the broader formation of the so-called cognitive maps. And that really came from just, you know, you just let rats do what, you know, what they naturally do. And I'll point to that again when we get back to, when I talk about the reactivation or replay of spatial sequential memory information um, that was uh, discovered by David Foster when he was in my lab, which is just a quiet, wakeful replay, which is, you know, how animals kind of revisit experience or, you know, uh, re-express sequences when they're just sitting doing nothing. And I always point to the inside there is, you know, that, that Foster was able to discover this, not by getting the animal to perform the task that he wanted it to perform, but allowing the animal to not do the task that he wanted to perform, to just sit and do nothing. And <clears throat> so in this case, the naturalistic behavior that O'Keefe had, had uh, you know, um, discovered that had this hippocampal correlate is shown here, where this is a top-down view of a of a C-shaped linear track. Animals got food reward at both ends. It runs up and down. The individual points here, individual action potentials. The color coding is based on their the, cl the clustering, the unit identity. And here you see the example of place cells. Uh, this yellow cell fires whenever the animals here in this part of the track, the red cell here, the green cell here, blue cell here. Uh, there's another property of place cells that O'Keefe had discovered and is somewhat illustrated here. It's a little harder to see. And that is that when animals uh, explore space, but, uh, but constrain that exploration to certain, certain circumscribed trajectories or paths, in this case, it doesn't just move around in this space, it actually runs along a path in this space. It goes from here to here, and then it comes around and goes back. The cells will acquire this additional you know, attribute of directionality, as this yellow cell will not just fire here, but it will fire preferentially when the animal goes through this location in this direction. As if it goes in this direction, you get this kind of firing, sequential firing is pop, 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 and then it'll be silent. The animal goes back in the other direction, it, the the firing rates will be different in the most in the you know the I would say the most common cases you'll find a dramatic attenuation so that it doesn't fire fires in this direction doesn't fire in this direction uh, and I can actually tell what the directional biases of these cells because another observation is made by another postdoc model at Mayak Meda and that is that when you look at place fields as they form as animals experience space. They don't just develop a spatial preference. They don't just direction, develop a directional preference, but they actually develop an asymmetry, a spatial and temporal asymmetry in their firing, such that you can kind of see it here. There's a lot of spiking here, not so much here. This is actually kind of a ramp-like as they, they, they add in, you add in a third moment to the response. They don't just fire at this location with some variance, but actually there's a skew to the fields. And so here you can tell like the tail is opposite the direction of motion. That's the idea. So you can so using that principle, you could tell me, well, you know, which direction do these cells fire? The red cell. Well, it looks like it's kind of skewed in this direction. Indeed, its directional preference is here. The green cell directional preference is this way. What about the blue cell? Uh, it's kind of like this way. So you can see the directional bias based on this asymmetry. And I, you know, I'll present a simple model that tries to link this asymmetry, the experiential formation of that asymmetry, and this fundamental temporal coding property that we see in the hippocampus that I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but here, so this is what place cells look like. They're spatial, 
directional. They have this kind of spatial and temporal asymmetry. Uh, and the other property of the hippocampus that's obviously that's you know uh, you know important, very notable, is that when you move the animal onto a, into another environment, context, whatever it might be, put it onto another maze. This, this track is actually actually spatially adjacent to it. It's not just in the figure, but you put it on another track right next to it. You get different cells, different firing patterns, but there's this, it's, it's, and they're largely uncorrelated. So you kind of get this orthogonal mapping of space for independent contexts. Put this animal in a different room, you can put it on the same maze in a different room, you get a different pattern. You put the animal back on the same maze in the same room, uh, you get largely the same pattern. And so that there's kind of a mapping of spatial context that allows you to distinguish different, you know, sort of different environments um, that can then be, you know, uh, restored upon uh, re-exposure. So it's like it is like a map. You don't want to use the same map for like, you know, you know, Boston, New York. You want to have two different maps. Uh, at the same time, you don't want the map of Boston to change every time you go back to Boston. So they had these had this sort of property that was that was sort of topographic, like behaved like a map. But there are other properties that aren't exactly like that. And that you might think of as being more related to how you might use a map. Well, you have a map of Boston. You don't want that, you know, the overall layout to change. You may very well want the kind of features that you use, the way in which you explore Boston. Well, maybe, you know, first visit, I come back, I go down to Fannel Hall. I, you know, I do all the, you know, the touristy things, the duck boats. The second visit, Maybe I go there, but I come down to the, you know, I come down to the Cape. And so there are different paths or trajectories. Your unique experience in those maps would differ. And so how do you kind of simultaneously capture the stationary property of the topography, but then the very non-stationary, experientially dependent experience of, you know, moving through that space, the topology. And so thinking about the topology, and that is how is the, how is the movement through space, that is the sequential dependence going from A to B, how is that captured? And you get the hints here and say, well, actually, so there's both right here, right? The sequence sort of reflected in changes in firing rate as a function of position that you could actually use that. You could say, oh, you know, if I look at this cell and I saw a low rate followed by high rate, I could sort of infer the, you know, the, the sequence. And so thinking about using the firing rate itself and the change of firing rate in time as a way of capturing the sequential structure within the field. And then using just the average firing rate, well, if this cell fired at all, I can tell you, you know, the, the overall pattern, the cell firing here, the cell firing here, the overall pattern is going to be, that's going to, that's going to allow you to identify the context. That's sort of the map. So two maps, the stationary part, you know, the topography, the non-stationary part, the topology, one carrying the time rate of change of the of firing rate, the other just the, the overall distribution or sort of the population vector of firing. Uh, and again, we'll see that both of those are reflected in the hippocampal code. When we now incorporate the third feature, there's the context, there's the, the direction of sequence, uh, but then there's also, this is just average activity over about 10 minutes, there's the instantaneous activity in time, which is dynamically modulated. So it's the time rate of change of firing uh, that is captured here when we look at, uh, this is just a movie that's illustrating hippocampal coding. And this is what you would get if you were, uh, you're on the rig, you got an animal here with the green circle identified, it's got the implant on there. We're recording real time spiking activity. And then we're just asking, okay, where are the spikes falling? When the animal's moving, it's just the real-time version of that, uh, you know, the static uh, uh, figure in the previous slide. And uh, oh, we don't have any audio. Oh, there is audio. So one thing that you see here is that you kind of see those fields coming. So you know, it just it sort of illustrates how powerful the spatial bias, spatial representation is. You can see it in the raw data, right? It doesn't tell only by any any passes. Where the average firing rate, single lapse, I see, oh, this one probably this one. You also can hear the activity. You can hear the activity and how it's modulated. And one thing, other than it being a little loud, 
is that there are really two modes that you can identify. One which you noted when the animal stopped is this kind of bursting. And then as the animal moved, you hear this kind of How many could actually hear that? How many can actually hear that modulation? Nobody. You know, that's it's funny because that's this, you know, having having you know listened to this for so many years, it just like immediately jumps out. I can be sitting here, and if I were sitting here and I couldn't, you know, I had a a, a rat I'd never recorded, not this slide, but just a rat, and I were listening to this, I could tell you exactly what the animals do. Oh, the animals like it just stopped. Oh, now it's like you know, now it's running just from the modulation. You can pick up that beta modulation in just a couple of cycles, just a few hundred milliseconds. Uh, but that's because it reflects the modulation of the population. All the cells are actually locked to this, and you kind of hear the... I'm going to give you one more chance to hear it. I'm just going to advance it to the... You hear that? But the important thing here is there is this modulation, but when the animal stops, you notice that there's this, there's a pause, the animal's going to stop, a little pause, and then there's a burst. Okay. The animal's going to start to pick up again, here, there's going to be beta, maybe starting to hear a little bit more, it's like really strong what you hear, I think you need he stops, pause. Okay. So there are really these two modes, and it can switch between these two modes, the theta and the non theta mode. It only takes about half a second to switch between them. And when we look at the activity, the temporal modulation of that activity in these two modes, it's really different. And, um, and I'll sort of illustrate that in, uh, in more detail after this slide, which is. This is just to kind of point out how you can take that spiking activity, and that's very qualitative. I'm telling you, oh, you know, listen, you can see, look, you can see the spikes are sort of, you know, look, that one likes a place feel, right? And you say, yeah, okay, sort of, I guess. You know, it's, there's some spatial bias, but is it really, is it really a spatial code? And that is, can you decode it? So obviously that's, you know, that's a critical, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a critical attribute code I could talk about like spatial patterning, maybe like spatial representation, that's like a correlate. But a code, as I always like to point out, requires a decoder. In the strongest sense, to talk about a neural code, I have to be able to point to the downstream structure and I have to be able to demonstrate that that downstream structure is capable of, of translating the activity from one area into the information that I'm positing is actually part of the code. I, I, downstream structure has to be able to decode it. In this case, we're just putting ourselves in the shoes of the downstream structure and saying, well, if we can decode it, then maybe we can just like talk about it as a you know, putative code. And so that's what we'll do here. Take all that activity, it's the same data, it's just that now instead of showing you the spike where the spikes are, we're gonna use a simple sort of Bayesian decoding algorithm as we just use Bayes theory to you know, invert the conditional probabilities as if I know, in this case, um, where the animal is from, if I have the place fields, I can tell you which cells are gonna fire, right? So you say, oh, look, you know, given that place field distribution, I know cell A had a place field here. So I know if the animal's here, blue cells, like that light blue cell is going to fire. I can use Bayes' rule to invert that and say, well, if I see the light blue cell firing, what's the probability that the animal's in this location versus any other location? So I use Bayes' rule to figure out the conditional probability of the animal at any location on the track given the firing of the population cells. And I'm going to illustrate that conditional probability using a triangle, size of the triangle is the magnitude of the probability. And so again, this is, so this Bayesian decoding is estimating probability at every location on it. So it's a triangle at every single location at every time frame. So every 200 milliseconds, compute the probabilities along the track, show you triangles. Um, and so what that looks like when you do that 200 millisecond decoding, triangles everywhere, there it is. You only see the triangle where the animal is, right? But there are probabilities being computed here, it's just there's zero. That is, if given the cells that are firing here, a downstream decoder would be able to determine the animal's location to within about two centimeters every 200 milliseconds. That's, that's sort of the estimate. And now you notice 
But that triangle disappears when the animal stops and you get these girths. Triangle disappears, no longer corresponds to the animal's current location. You see kind of jumping around. Again, because they're competing triangles everywhere, abilities everywhere. And so this is animal stops. Okay, so you kind of see it jumping around. Now there's another the, the, the decoding also uses color here to indicate the direction of firing. So blue is in the direction that the animal is going, red is in the opposite direction. So you saw another property of that, and that is there are a bunch of red triangles being expressed. What that means is it was decoding position that were opposite the direction of the animal's core motion. And that turns out to be a property of these so-called replay events, and that is that they can move forward or backward in time. They can be forward or reverse in time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it looks like from, from just the picture that it's much easier to get the position uh, when the animal is moving than when it stops. Is it that this... Uh, mean that maybe when the animal is, stop, is stopping, maybe it's also doing something else, which is kind of like serving the signal or stuff like that? That's exact. That's the, you, you got exactly the point I was trying to make and that this was trying to illustrate, that there are these two modes that when the animal stops, you don't actually decode the animal's location. You, it decodes some remote locations. And because of it, it suggests that, well, maybe these two modes are actually performing two different functions. And so we can kind of think of what might those two different functions be. Uh, and so this then, uh, this is just a kind, of a, a kind of a quick illustration of another state that the animal can be in. So in the, the previous you know, video, you were seeing the animal running in a, in a task. And there were periods where it was locomoting, where you got this rhythm the theta rhythm, and then stopping, what we refer to as like, you know, quiet, wakeful immobility, um, and you get these kind of bursts. But there's also prolonged periods of immobility. The animal sits or we take it off, uh, will translate into sleep. And so this is now the animal's finished running the maze. We take it out, put it in a little separate sleeping box. You kind of see it here. It's been cropped for whatever reason. But this is like uh, the animal's curled up. It's sleeping. But now we continue to decode. So the animal's not in the space anymore, but we can still decode activity as though it were in the space. And what you see here is an example of this reactivation. You see the reactivation. It's very much like when the animal was stopping. You see these triangles jumping around the, the track very quickly. When we kind of zoom in and slow it down, what you'll see is in both those cases, quiet mobility and during sleep, the primary mode of hippocampal activity is the reactivation of spatial sequences in this accelerated time frame that is that you know rapidly moving along a path with an effective velocity of about 10 times the average velocity about uh, 6 to 10 meters per second that's the uh, and <clears throat> yeah um so, so when that about sleeping and you're seeing these replay events how do you know that because what you've done is you've constrained the problem, the decoding problem, to the task that you're doing. Yep. So, I mean, the rat could be dreaming about running Absolutely. in any other environment, but you've just decided to interpret it as running on your maze. Correct. So how do you know for, with any degree of certainty that the thing you're looking at is replay on the maze? Yeah, that's a statistical argument. So you don't know. So you're actually, so you, you're only, you can only see what you're looking for. Um, but there are other ways, and, you know, maybe we can touch on this later, that you could potentially interrogate these decodable, you know, uh, structures without having the, uh, the kind of the model posteriors that you would use to do decoding. So if you don't know what they represent, but you ask, can I, for instance, use uh, an unbiased approach that, that presumes there is this kind of sequential structure you could use, for instance, you know, hidden Markov models to say, can we, dis can we, can we distinguish you know, repeated sequences from like random activity. Could we try to decode the structure and content, right, in some abstract space of reactivated content? That's possible. One of the things that, that, uh, that comes up when you perform this decoding on sleep data versus the quiet wakeful data is that in quiet wakefulness, what you find is when you apply the model, the decoding model that is the current context, you find that you can decode about 70% of the events. When you apply it in sleep, it's now like 5 to 10 percent of the events. So what it suggests is there's a lot of other stuff. You get these bursts, right? You see patterns of activity. It's just that you can't decode it using this fixed, you know, the one uh, place field model. 
that you had that you had drawn from particular experience on a particular maze, suggesting that in sleep there's reactivation, but it's much more heterogeneous. You're reactivating a whole bunch of stuff during quiet wakefulness. You're also reactivating stuff, but it tends to be focused on the immediate context. So that's that's the interpretation. But you're right. You can have a lot of stuff that you can't decode because you don't know what it is that you're looking for. And this approach, obviously, the you know, the, you know, the Bayesian approach requires that you actually have a model. You have to have you know a posterior model that you're you know that you're applying uh, to determine how well does this data fit to that. Um, do you know what happens with uh, animals that live in 3D that like fly or like can have like Kind of vertical. Oh, the three-dimensional. Yeah, yeah. Three-dimensional placements are really, you know, those are, uh, those are, those are pretty interesting. Um, so, you know, um, rats, you know, they don't, they don't really exist. They don't really explore in three dimensions, even though they can, you know, they sort of move along surfaces that that, that will, you know, vary in z. You always kind of think of them as moving along a surface. So when you kind of think about like the topology of space that rats tend to, have, you know, occupy. It really is defined by a circuit surface, I mean a deformed surface. So thinking about what are animals that actually do occupy three-dimensional space topologically, and that is that from any point, you know, you can go to any other point, right, in three dimensions. Uh, you think about flying animals. And so there's a lot of really, you know, in, interesting work in bats recording hippocampal activity place cells in bats. And they have, you, you find, yeah, they have, uh, they have place cells, they have grid cells. And indeed, when you map out their place fields in three-dimensional space, they fill a volume, three-dimensional fields. And you, again, this, this sort of highlights the fact that when you think about the spatial code here, it's not just being in three-dimensional space, it's how you explore the three-dimensional space. So animals that actually have three real degrees of freedom, like from here, I could actually go you know, anywhere in this three-dimensional space then you find the hippocampal cells will span that space. If it's really, I'm here, sure, I can walk up to there, and that varies in Z, it's still along a two-dimensional path, then you get, you get two-dimensional representations. So the, the place fields really represent the way in which you explore the space, and not just the physical attributes of the space. Uh, but yeah, bats, three-dimensional place fields. Uh, very cool. Another thing about the bats, uh, uh, is that you can look at that using you know recordings that are not just constrained to small environments that we're looking at here. You can look at large environments, and what you find there is the bats, which kind of have to navigate over you know miles. And so what happens to the place fields there? And what you find is that the place fields will scale. They will scale to the distances that are involved in navigating in large spaces, suggesting that again, it's not it's not like a sort of a fixed Cartesian map design. It's not the GPS, right? It's just uh, yep. So uh, since you brought up the fact that um, it was actually explored what bats, how they have mapped the environment when it actually opens up. So one thing that was striking about this um, when I heard about it, that it doesn't scale linearly, yeah. but sublinearly. So this idea of sequential coding seems to be at odds with the fact that you don't have to scale linearly. Because if you have a well, tenfold increase, so the sequential uh, co coding should have been Increased linearly. Well, linearly, this is this again, in a in a you know in a topographic sense, it does not. But that's the nature of topology, right? And that is, it's the distance you throw out distance, and, uh, <clears throat> and so it it sort of reinforces the idea that the hippocampal representation is really more topological. That it can you know that you will find topographic structure when there's sort of a dense coding of let's say proximal space. But that there is another kind, there's another form of the code that allows you to capture long distance relationships, not by their metric, not by metric distance, but rather just by their, you know, the, 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 the connectivity. And how do you establish connectivity that's not just large in space, but large in time? And so that's really the, I think that's, uh, you know, computationally, that's sort of the challenge. I think one thing that's interesting about the, yeah, the large scale large distance data is that you do have that the fields themselves do scale and so that suggests that there is that spanning large temporal you know gaps is achieved by kind of stretching the spatial information now, how do you stretch the spatial information 
Um, one way of thinking about it is that the place fields themselves are not necessarily formed from like this dense topographic information, but you can think that they emerge as a consequence of experience in space that has natural spatial gradients that have these different time scales or spatial scales. And those spatial scales are not linear. And that is, you know, what are the signals that I would use if I was kind of going from here to the, you know, <laughs> to the back of the hall? Well, there are proximal visual cues that are going to vary. There's like their gradients, auditory gradients that, that um, have a, a, you know, a, a distance metric based on the physical structure of the space. But if I'm going out, if I want to go from here to Martha's Vineyard, for instance, I don't use those cues. Now I'm going to use distal cues. I'm going to use, they could be, uh, they could be cues, for instance, uh, you know, sun angle, or I, I pick out a landmark, which is now going to vary, right, in terms of angle. This is like the path integration argument. And so I'm going to use natural cues that, that have spatial gradient information that I can use to compute uh, uh, these topological connections within space. Those are not going to be those are not going to be linear. In fact, if you now scale this out to even even you know beyond oh you know meters, hundreds of meters, thousands of meters, uh, you look at, um, uh, at like migrating animals. You know you have whales that can go. You know they can they can they can you know go the, the uh, you know sort of almost the circumference of the planet, right? So you can go you go you know you know, thousands, tens of thousands of meters, what are they actually using? Bird, migrating birds, what are they using? And so now you have all the strategies. You have polarized light, you have magnetic fields, you have, you know, so there are lots of, uh, there are lots of uh, sensor, there's a lot of sensory information that has natural spatial gradient structure that you could leverage. And so it's this idea that place fields are actually, uh, they're, they're simply transforming nascent spatial gradient information that's in the environment into this code that you can use to span, you know, to get from point A to point B. It's not representing space. Space is already you know, represented in a way. You're just extracting from that, the, you know, the environmental representation, useful information that you can use to perform like these navigational functions, which again is why you're not representing space so much as you're using spatial information. And the idea that it's spatial gradients in particular that you use because the gradients have this natural scaling. Uh, you know, the fields, magnetic fields, they're always there. How they change with distance is in their magnitude. There's a natural gradient, visual information, natural gradient structure, auditory information is natural gradient structure. And um, so that, that kind of factors in when I sort of get to the simple model of temporal coding. This idea that gradients are really a critical are really critical to the way in which the hippocampus transforms, you know, world state information into its code is really kind of central. You think about spatial gradients, place fields in the hippocampus. I'll mention, I know I'll show it uh, some other really interesting work that was done by a former graduate student actually at MIT, uh, 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 Dmitry Aronoff, who worked with David Tank and did this experiment in the hippocampus, uh, uh, doing imaging but also recording. Uh, 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 while animals performed an auditory discrimination task. And so instead of having to, you know, remember location space, they had to, they had to associate a particular frequency with a response. It's simple, you know, conditioning. But the, the frequency tones were varied in time. So they had these frequency sweeps. Animals had to, you know, determine, oh, when does, you know, the, uh, <coughs> uh, the kind of the conditional tone as it presented. And what he found was that when you have animals perform this task, detecting a, a you know a tone and frequency sweeps, you get you get place field like activity, except it's now in frequency space rather than you know spatial space. Uh, so you get these tone fields, and they they look very much like place fields. In fact, if you look at the same cells and you put them into a spatial context, they are place cells. They're place cells when they're running in space. They're tone cells when they're running in this task. Again, the essential property of this task is that the tones are presented in this gradient-like structure. It's, a, it's an ordered sequence of, you know, varying frequency. Uh, and so, again, suggesting that, you know, the hippocampus likes gradients. It likes taking gradients and then using those gradients to create representations that will allow you to do, like, temporal prediction. What's, you know, what location will come next? What, what, what tone will come next? What event will come next? What person will come next? It's all about 
you know, sort of translating or extracting gradient information from the sensor environment. Yeah. Um, place cell be represent another place field in another task or absolutely. another location. Yeah, absolutely. So the, you know, the question, I show you a place field in one, you know, in one environment, and then the example I showed you is, oh, you put it in a different environment, you get different cells. But you will also see the same cells, but just with different configuration. So one thing about the place field sampling is, and the reason you can even do this is, when you put an animal in, a in an environment, record the place cells, you're going to get about 30 to 50% of the cells that will have some behavioral correlate. So 30, 50% in one environment, right? If it's, if they're, you know, uh, if you're using completely unique sampling, your capacity is down to about like three environments, right? Uh, so what it is, it's the configuration of cells. And you see, it's just like a random grab, random draw. You can think about, put you in one environment, random draw 30% of the cells. I throw them out. The distribution is random, but the cell, you know, and so you can't decode necessarily just using single cells. You need the you need a population. So so and, and is the shape of the place field similar between the two? Great great question. And that is you know so the shape of the place field you could say changes with experience, and so the shape of the place field can can be used to you know to both kind of decode but also maybe represent the you know the topology the experience within. A, you know, a fixed base. So yeah, that actually does change. It changes lap to lap. Okay. And that is the. And sorry, last last point. So when you put the animal back, that place cell will go back to its place field that it was before. Is well, that... the location will be there, but you know, like this shape, for instance, the change in the, the asymmetry of the shape, the asymmetry is retained. Okay. So it's like the animal knows it both recognize the space and also recognizes the the trajectory bias that was present. This is what I did in this space, right? This is like a linear track. It, it, it knows that already. Which implies that there were some latent dynamics which drive the shape of grace fields. Exactly okay. right. And can you derive those latent dynamics? Right. And you can think of this being that, you know, this could be a plasticity mechanism, a synaptic plasticity mechanism. Uh, there have been some interesting, uh, you know, sort of novel behavioral timescale plasticity mechanisms that have been you know, identified by Jeff McGee, for instance, in the hippocampus that could capture this like plasticity, this like spike time independent plasticity, not just capturing temporal, you know, order input output, uh, you know, relationships on the millisecond tens or hundred millisecond time scale, but on the seconds time scale. And so that would be ideal for kind of capturing, oh, I want to capture the fact that I was here. And then a second later I was here. Uh, and as we'll see, the fundamental representation of the hippocampus is not location, it's not just direction, but it actually is sequence. And that's a, there's a code within the theta oscillation that captures sequences, and we call them theta sequences, that are on roughly the time scale of about three seconds. That's about, if you look at you know, the sequences that are expressed every 100 milliseconds, it's like, where is the animal going to be in the next you know, couple of seconds? So it suggests that that's sort of the relevant time scale for capturing this topological information, the quantal unit of, of uh, sequential topology. And that's really what I was going to illustrate here. And that is that in these two cases, the, the, these two states where you can hear the, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And this is the sort of, the, I'll, I'll just break it here and we'll, you know, when I sort of introduce the idea of the theta oscillation. So you could hear it, like these different states, you can see it in the local field potentials, where again, the local field potentials are largely telling you this is how the inputs are being modulated, the differences in the way inputs are being modulated. And here, the inputs are being modulated in this rhythmic fashion. When the animal stops, this quiet wakeful state where you've got these bursts and you know the replayed activity seem to you know sort of capture remote locations. What you see here instead are these what are referred to as sharp waves, so these big deflections in the extracellular field, suggesting that you're getting a lot of synchronized input. So rhythmically modulated input, synchronized input. And if you now look at this, this rhythmically modulated, the theta rhythm, I'll just break it here. This sort of, in, you look at the, the relationship between spiking activity and this rhythm. This is like the input, and this is like the output. Um, here, this illustrates something that John O'Keefe also discovered in early 1990s, 1990. 91, and that is that not only does the firing rate of the cell change as a function of position, that's the number of spikes, 
but the timing of the spikes, and that is the phase relationship between the spike here, this is the theta rhythm, again, the input, where like we just sort of arbitrarily define zero phase at the peak. And if you look at the timing of the spikes, here, the animal is now running through a place field. You can kind of imagine it's running from left to right. It doesn't, you know, this is in time, not space. But you imagine animals running through a place field. As it first enters the field, as I had illustrated before, you have this kind of ramping firing rate, right? This firing starts low, kind of pop, 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 and then it gets high. Well, you kind of see this here, pop, 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 right? Low rate, intermediate rate, high rate. Now you look at the timing of the spike. So this spike, the single spike, low firing rate, occurs here near the peak. But as the animal gets moves through the field, the timing of the first spike in these, you know, in a series of spikes advances, fires earlier and earlier. O'Keefe noticed this and described this as what, what he referred to as phase precession, as an orderly relationship between distance within the field and absolute phase with respect to the theta rhythm. Uh, and that's just and that's just illustrated here. This is what phase precession looks like. If now, instead of just taking like this marginal distribution of firing, you know, rate as a function of position, I now include theta phase. So this is like if I just collapse this, this is the place field, right? Few spikes over here, lots of spikes over here. This is the place field that I showed you in space. Now, if we add in time, what you see is, oh, so the animal enters the field, spikes start late, and then they get early. And this was so pronounced, you looked at it in every cell, O'Keefe at the time, uh, interpreted this as the hippocampal code for space is not actually in firing rate, but rather is in firing phase. That, you know, if I just look at the firing rate, I can kind of tell you where the animal is roughly, but if I look at the phase, I can tell you where the animal is precisely within the field. Um, so we'll just, we'll just leave it at that. This is the idea of phase coding, and then we'll pick it up after uh, the break, what this actually means.